Good afternoon, good day, good morning. I want to welcome you back to our study of the Old Testament. As we come to the end of our Old Testament study, we will look at the last two processes, the process of transmission and the process of translation. We've already looked at how the Bible came to us. God inspired his word. And secondly, God gave wisdom and direction to people to choose what was the right books to include and which books to leave out. They had to meet certain criteria, whether they agreed with the rest of the scripture, were they written by a prophet, did they change life, all these are the criteria that they had to go through as they scrutinized as inclusion or exclusion. Some which were included were still challenged. People had questions on them. We saw the book of Esther. It doesn't mention God anywhere in the, Bible, in the book, but it was included. The book of Esther even has the story of the deliverance of the Jewish people from genocide, which was planned by Hanan, Haman, the Agagite, and Esther was the tool used by God to protect the Jewish people in Persia from genocide. And the Jews celebrate a feast known as Purim, which is a memory of that particular time. As we continue in our study of from God to us, how the, Bible, the Old Testament came to us, we look at two extra steps, transmission and translation, and to end our Old Testament study. The question is, how did the Old Testament come down from Moses to us? How did the Old Testament writers write from there, and how did it come down to us? Moses wrote his material in 1400 BC, Malachi wrote his book between 440 and 400 BC. So the Old Testament, all the 39 books were completed and selected by 400 BC. It took a thousand years to put everything together. So 400 years before Jesus even came to earth to die for our sins, there was already a completed Old Testament. It was completed in 400 BC. So 400 years before Christ, it was a complete Old Testament. Now how did these writings from 1400 BC to 400 BC, how did they come down to us? To our modern era? How did we get them? We got this through a process of transmission and translation. Two processes. What is transmission? Transmission is getting the books copied from one generation to the next generation. Now you must appreciate that it was a labor intensive work. They did not have computers in the day. They did not have any printing presses in the day. They had to copy by hand. You've got a 1,000 page document that you must copy by hand. It's labor intensive, but they had to do it. They had to copy this text that God had given them and preserve it and transmit it to other generations. They had to copy it by hand. Our printing press was only, only, only invented in 1440 by Johannes Gutenberg. That's our modern automatic printing press. 1440. But you're talking of people who are writing in 400 BC. They had to copy by hand, word for word, letter for letter, text for text, sentence for by hand. And you know how difficult that is? You can have problems, you miss a line, you add a word, you repeat the sentence. All those are challenges that you face when you copy by hand. So you can easily make 
some errors. So you, you're going to find as you study the Old Testament, there will be some few areas where there will be some errors that exist. But modern day scholars, Bible scholars, known as textual critics. A textual critic is a scholar who looks at various manuscripts, examines them, and compares them to see which one was close to the original, or which one is the closest, or which ones agree, are more in agreement, so to say, until they can find the right word for the right place. So those textual critics have been able to help us to decipher some of these errors that were made by people who were copying the text by hand. And in the new modern versions, they've been able to clarify them, or they'll put a small footnote in your Bible, and if you click on that footnote, you'll find at the bottom, there's an explanation of that particular uh, challenge. I'll give you an example. 1 Samuel 13, verse 1. 1 Samuel 13, verse 1, is one scripture where there is an error. The error just made by a copy. One was copying a scribe. In the King James, it says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. So Saul reigned one year, and then he reigned two years over Israel. Why did he just say Saul reigned two years? Because two years means that he even reigned one year before the two years. The American Standard Version of 1901 translates this passage as Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned two years over Israel. I compare it also with the New American Standard Version, the first one. In 1977, it says Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 32 years. So, ASV says two years. New American Standard Bible says 32 years. The NIV says Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Hang on. New American says he reigned 32 years. NIV says he reigned 42 years. New American says Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign. NIV says Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign. Hmm. The door reigns, a Roman Catholic translation says Saul was a child of one year when he began to reign. And he reigned two years over Israel. The Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, says Saul was dash, 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 there's no num number there, years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years over Israel. The New Revised Standard Version and the Revised Standard Version and the ESV, the earlier one says Saul was dash, 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 years when he began to reign, and he reigned dash, 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 and two years over Israel. So in the New, New Revised Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the ESV, the earlier one, there are no words there. So which is the correct translation of this particular passage? When you go to the Hebrew text, the words are missing. There are no words. It's blank. They couldn't find, they don't know what, what, what words are supposed to be there. So the one that's closest to what's supposed to be is the New Revised Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the earlier version of the ESV. Saul reigned, dash, 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 there's no, no word there, over, uh, was da, 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 years old, and then da, 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 he reigned over Israel. There's nothing there. That's the correct version, because there's nothing in the original translation. People have added their own, what they thought. Where the NIV get that from? They went to Acts 13, where God talks about how old, how many years Saul reigned when he was take, when he was replaced by David. They take it from there and put it in there. Another example. This one is an example of an error that was done by a scribe. A scribe copying the text makes an error. 
Job chapter 2, verse 9. And 1 Kings 21, verse 13. You know, these are common stories. These are popular stories. Job 2. Job has got all these boils over his body. His wife comes to him and says, our Bible says, curse God and die. And 1 Kings 21, 13, Jezebel finds two scoundrels who went and brought a false report against Naboth because she wanted Naboth's vineyard for husband Ahab. And when these people came and accused Naboth, they said, we heard Naboth, he cursed God and he cursed the king. What's the problem? If you go back to the Hebrew text, it doesn't say, curse God and die. The Hebrew version actually says, bless God and die. Bless God and die. Let's read what it says. In the NIV, it says, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. The New King James says, his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to integrity? Curse God and die. The literal standard version says, his wife says to him, you are still keeping hold on your integrity? Bless God and die. The door reigns of 1899, the Catholic version of 1899, says, and his wife said to him, Dost thou still continue in thy simplicity? Bless God and die. So, there's a confusion. Some versions say, curse God and die. Other versions say, bless God and die. The question is, how do you bless God and pay the price for blessing God? How? How does God execute you or men execute you for blessing God? There are many people who are told, bless the Lord, all oh my soul, and all that's within him, bless his holy name. And then after you finish doing that, boom, you're killed. What happened? Here was a problem with a scribe. When the scribe was copying this particular text, and he came to this text, and he thought to himself, curse God. Mm -mm. You can't say curse God. He changed from curse God, he put in bless God. Because the Hebrew word is Baruch, bless God. But he forgot to change the other part and die. Because you can't bless God and die. So most of these other translations have maintained that, the literal standard translation, the Young's literal translation, and the Doha Reigns have maintained that, bless God and die. But textual critics were able to analyze this and say it doesn't make sense because you can't bless God and die. Actually, it should have been curse God and die. And so they made the changes in all the modern translations. It reads, curse God and die. It's only those three versions that have got that. And also, someone said in the Latin Vulgate, the, the word the, the, is the same. In 1 Kings 21, 13, it says, the two men, sons of transgressors, came in and sat opposite him and bore witness against him, saying, you have blessed God and the king. And they led him forth out of the city and they stoned him with stones and he died. That's the Septuagint, the Greek version, Greek translation of the Old Testament. Young's literal translation says, And two men, sons of worthlessness, came in and sat over against him. And the men of worthlessness testified of him, even Naboth, before the people saying, Naboth blessed God and the king. And the people took him, Naboth, out to the, to the outside of the city and they stoned him with stones and he died. That's Young's literal translation. But the text of critics saw through that, saw the mistake was done by the scribe and they've been able to correct it. Most modern versions now say Naboth cursed God and died. And the king. So in transmission, it's the scribe copying the text that he has found, and um, they copied it word, I mean, manually, physically. They had to copy it by hand. They didn't have word, 
They didn't have computers. So as a result, they didn't even have Microsoft Word and Office with spell check. So they could not check their spellings. They had to do it by hand, manually. The last part is translation. So once the scribe has copied the text, the next stage is to translate it into our languages. The scribes copied over 2,000 years ago, and those scriptures have to be translated into other languages. That process of translating from one language to another one is called translation. The scriptures initially done in Hebrew and there's some portions in Aramaic had to be translated into our own languages. So the various theories that exist of translation, and you all know that when you translate things from one language to another one, some things do get tend to, lost in the to be lost in the translation. Because we can't find the exact literal meaning or equivalent word in another language. For example, the Hebrews have a word chesed, H-E-S-E-D. We don't, we don't know which, how to, to put that word in English. We call it love, kindness, stubborn love, steadfast love. So it's translated so many various ways, that one simple word in Hebrew, because we don't have the right word to use in English. So you see what the problem is when you come to translation. You don't find the exact one for the, the equivalent one in there. So there are many different ways of translating. Let me give one example of a problem in translation. Proverbs 23, 26, verse 13. It talks of silver dross. If you read it, like a pot shed with silver dross. What's a pot shed? A pot shed was a broken pot. You know, pots were made with mud, and after some time, the mud pot would break. And then the King James says, pot shed with silver dross. Dross is when you melt silver, that stuff that comes to the top when silver is being melted and purified is normally scooped out and thrown away because it's the junk of the silver. So the, the good stuff remains. So how do you take the stuff that you're supposed to throw away and then go and coat it on a pot? But the King James writers translated it in 1611. Modern day translators have been able to look through that and see the error that was there by the scribe or error that was there, and they've been able to retranslate it properly to give it the correct meaning. The correct meaning being glazing. When you glaze, you polish the pot. You put glaze on top of it. You don't put silver dust, you put glaze on top of it. So the various theories of how translations are done, and I'll be ending shortly. Some think of translating word for word. Very difficult task, because some words are not going to be found in another language. As literal as you can, we normally say when you're trans interpreting the scripture, take it as literal as you can unless the context demands otherwise. Others translate it meaning for meaning. You look at what the meaning of the particular text is and try and find the meaning in another language. Others have chosen a new method of translation known as the politically correct view, where everything that is offensive is removed and replaced with the politically correct term. In the book that I've done, Says the scriptures have looked at some of these politically correct versions. Versions that remove anything that is offensive. For instance, people in the feminist movements find it very offensive that God is, is referred to as he or in a masculine. And they feel that is abusing them as women. And so such individuals have come up with politically correct versions where instead of saying he or she, they've used a gender 
sensitive word that does not support either male or female. One example that always comes to mind when I talk about these things is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead, you remember the angels asked the women, who are you looking for? Are you looking for Jesus of Nazareth? He's not here. He's risen. A feminist Bible has changed that text to, are you looking for Judith? She's not here. She's risen. So you see, there's these challenges that we face. So translation is when they take, the text has been transmitted and they make it, they translate it into other languages of the world. And that's where you find your Bible societies coming in and various primary sources that are used. Either they use the, te the, the text that was existing, the Masoic text, or they use the Septuagint, or they use the, the, the Samaritan Pentateuch, or they, they use so many uh, sources that were existing for translations of the Old Testament. What are we saying? What have we said so far? What have we been saying so far is that God has given us his word. And this word has come to us as an Old Testament. What we've been covering. So we need to be able to understand this word so that we can be able to appreciate our study of the word. As we come to the end of our study of the Old Testament, let me just make two final thoughts. As you study the Old Testament, you're going to come across two words, very common, very popular, high places and the sins of Jeroboam. It's important for you to understand these words. High places were places of worship. And the sins of Jeroboam is something also, a topic that you need to really, really understand. It goes way back to the first time Jeroboam became king. Because of the conflict that existed between the northern tribe and the southern tribes of Israel, a number of changes were made by Jeroboam. He chose a city in the northern area where they could go for their pilgrimage instead of going down to Judah in Jerusalem, Jerusalem in Judah. He chose priests that were not of the Le 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 tribe of Levi. So he made all these crazy changes. And the Bible talks so many places about kings that did well but continued in the sins of Jeroboam. They followed the idolatry of Jeroboam. So we need to be able to take some time and just study those to give us a better understanding as we study the Old Testament. So as we come to the end of our study of the Old Testament, let me say this. Our study of the religions of the Old Testament one key thing you find from there is that God said to the Israelites very specifically, as you enter the land that I'm going to give you, do not compromise. Do not follow the gods of those people. Don't follow their religions. They're going to teach you the horrible ways that they use to worship their gods. You know the story? The Israelites fell. They failed to obey God and instead went into those worships of those foreign gods. We are living in an age and time when things are very difficult. And there's such a demand for us to compromise and do what is what everybody else is doing. It's time to take your stand. I'll leave you with Joshua 24. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Or like Elijah said to the, to the people of God, if Ba is God, worship him. If Yahweh is God, worship him, but make up your mind. So a child of God, saints, people of God, I say to you, in this difficult time that we are, where there's such a demand for us to compromise with the things of this world and the demands of this world, demands of people in authority, choose you this day who you will save. If you want to be part of the crowd, go ahead. That's your choice. But if you want to continue worshiping God and working with God, then make that decision. You can't be on the fence. 
You've got to make your decision very clear. Make your decision. God bless you. I trust you've had a word. One over time, now study of the Old Testament. And as we continue on, as we come to the end, brother, the Lord richly bless you. If you go to the website, to the Facebook page, and to the YouTube channel, you'll find all these videos available. 12 videos that we've covered the last 12 weeks. So we'll take a small break, then we'll come back. We'll come and look at the period after Malachi chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 1. That period in between. In case you didn't know, it's a gap of 400 years. What happened between those two, that period of 400 years? What happened? We'll discuss that in our next course. God bless you. If you've been blessed, like the video, make a comment on YouTube or Facebook, and subscribe to our channel. God richly, richly bless you. Shalom, shalom. Peace be with you. Amen. Thank you.